I'd like to introduce Dr. Max Rohr. Max is a philosopher and strategic economist who writes, speaks, and consults on advanced decision-making about emerging technologies and the future. He is the author of the Transhumanist Philosophy. He developed the Proactionary Principle in 2004 after President George W. Bush's Bioethics Committee said transhumanism is the world's most dangerous idea with an imbalanced approach to genetic engineering and looking at biotechnology. The Proactionary Principle approaches decision-making from a balanced approach showing all sides of the issues. Max Moore is also the visionary behind the concept of morphological freedom, which means that people have a right to enhance and augment their bodies and their brains at their own discretion, as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else. And at the same time, it protects those who do not want to enhance, augment, or perform any type of genetic engineering as their choice. They cannot be coerced to do so. Currently, Dr. Max Moore is the ambassador at Alcor Life Extension Foundation, the world's largest cryonics organization. And he is also the foundation's president emeritus. Thank you and welcome Max Moore. Thank you. And since we have people from many time zones, I should say good day, good evening and good night. Uh, I especially want to thank everybody involved in organizing this fantastic conference with a tremendous turnout. And most of all, of course, Natasha, who's really done an amazing job, also known as Dr. Vita Moore, also known as my wife, which I have to, have to be proud of that. So thank you very much. Um, the topic I'm gonna to talk about, universal basic income and alternatives, is something that has been on blogs and in the news a lot recently in the last few years, but it's not a new idea by any means. The reason I'm addressing it is that Quite a few transhumanists and futurist types seem to really like the idea. Intuitively, it can seem very appealing, but I think there are some real problems with it. And certainly we need to dig into the details and not just kind of hope that everything will work out well. We don't want to be like some of those, uh, some of the early socialists who talked about the seas will be made of lemonade and everything will be free kind of thing. We need to actually look at the details. Um, and if I really wanted to make UBI instantly unpopular, I would point out that uh, a kind of a limited version of the UBI, Universal Basic Income, was created by President Trump recently by giving away money in the Emergency Money for the People Act. But I won't do that because that wouldn't be, <laughs> that wouldn't be fair. Uh, so the term really basic, that it's usually called the UBI, basic income, sometimes called the citizen's income. You get income just by being a citizen or demograt sometimes. Those are particularly popular on the left of the political spectrum. I don't like that term particularly, but you know what it means sort of. Uh, well, on the so-called right, the negative income tax has been used uh, as championed by Milton Friedman and others, uh, which I'll get to a little later, it's a slightly different version. Basic income at its root is a plan to replace all or most existing state benefits by a single payment made unconditionally to all citizens or perhaps residents of a country. And the unconditional is an important aspect of it. That's what makes it universal. And it's also what leads to some problems, I think. Uh, so you know, when futurists and transhumanists discuss this, I usually just say them saying, you know, I think this is a good idea. I haven't seen much discussion of it. Uh, I did see, uh, read Callum Chase, spent a few pages on it in one of his books recently. Um, but I think we need to look at some of the details here. What is the problem it's trying to solve? Well, I think the main problem is, uh, well, it's obviously a problem that current welfare systems are extremely expensive and inefficient. Uh, they can be quite intrusive. Um, they have bad incentives in many cases, uh, but I think for transhumanists, really the main issue is we, some of us at least expect that as AI really takes off at some point, unemployment may increase considerably. And so the idea basically is if you have, if you're looking forward to a lot of structural unemployment as AI gets better at doing most things that human beings do, you, what are you gonna do? How are people going to live? And the idea essentially is, uh, Whereas in the kind of the current worldview, uh, you'd be taxing, uh, raising taxes pretty high, as I'll get to. In the futurist kind of perspective, you'd be presumably taxing AI-driven corporations um, and then distributing that money. First of all, I'm, I've kind of come up with the alternative term, universal distributed capitalism. I know capitalism is not a very popular term these days. Uh, people usually say it with, a, with kind of a spit. 
Uh, I should note that I'm trying to reclaim the term a little bit. Uh, the term capitalism was not invented by capitalists or by free marketeers. It, uh, I'm not sure who actually originally coined it, but it was really Karl Marx who popularized the term. Uh, what I don't like about it is it focuses on an abstraction rather than on people and relationships, which is why I prefer market, because that really involves people exchanging things uh, and sort of understanding each other's needs. Now, first of all, um, I have to skim through a whole bunch of points here, but it's not at all certain there will be a large amount of technological unemployment. I know people say, well, it'd be different this time, because in the past, yes, there has been short run unemployment, but in the long run, obviously technology has created more jobs, otherwise we'd all be unemployed by now. Uh, so we kind of need to show that, that it will actually happen. And it may not, you know, Robin Hanson has pointed out that um, there are certain jobs that humans do that require a particular level of computer power. Um, now, what if the job power levels, you know, a certain chunk of jobs require a certain amount of, uh, of power, computing power, thinking power, what if they're distributed not normally, but log normally? And in fact, many, many things are distributed log normally. Um, in that case, an exponential growth in computing power, as Robin points it, will, will translate into a linear rate at which computers displace humans on jobs. Uh, now, of course, there could be clumps where there's a sudden decrease in jobs and then it might slow down. So it's not necessarily going to be smooth. But overall, it's quite possible that you could have exponential uh, change with computing power, but a relatively steady state of job displacement. So it may or may not be a problem. And it's really kind of hard to say. Now, if we're going to use something like a UBI, we have to realize that there are a number of complications. First of all, typically UBI is targeted at giving money to individuals, every universal individual income. But is that the right way to do it? Um, should it go to households? That's a very important question because current welfare systems sometimes try to target households. And that's pretty important because you can imagine you have someone who's earning $200,000 a year uh, and they're living in a household with someone who's earning 15,000 a year and might officially be poor, but they may be sharing their income. They may have children who aren't earning anything. So if you just give money to everybody, regardless uh, of household, you may be just throwing money at, at people who really don't need it. You know, they're quite well off as a household. So that's kind of an important thing. Uh, do you want to give it to a millionaire spouse who, who routinely enjoys lunch with the friends while the nanny looks after the couple? I don't know. Uh, also, is it going to be payable to immigrants? Uh, to only legal immigrants, to illegal immigrants also. Um, it seems, you know, if, if one country adopts this or adopts it at a higher level than other countries, there's going to be a tremendous pull for immigration. And that's going to increase the financing needs even further. And I just want to say, I'm generally in favor of lots of immigration. I think that's how America got, uh, well, as, as great as it did get, however great that was. Uh, I think immigration has been very important to this country and will continue to be but not a system that attracts people who want to become, who not want to be, but who will become dependent. So that's another question that needs addressing and I haven't seen addressed. Um, another big problem with it really is it's extremely expensive. And when I see transhumanists say, oh, I love this idea, it's, it's very cool, it's very simple. I don't really see them grappling with the numbers. Uh, one issue is people who advocate UBI often say, well, look, this will replace all the existing welfare systems and therefore won't really cost more or not that much more. Well, that's nice in theory, but will that actually happen in reality? To look at real politics, that could be actually pretty tough. Um, it may be that it'll get added on to existing welfare programs or to some of them, or maybe it'll initially replace them, but then we'll find, as, as I'll come to, uh, you have to start adding on other, uh, other welfare programs. Uh, and I'll, I'll give some reasons for that. I mean, what if people have uh, disability or special needs? Are they gonna exist on a basic income of 10,000, 12,000 a year? It's not gonna happen. It's not going to cover a lot of healthcare. So then you have to start having add on programs, or what economists call contingencies will matter, age will matter, health will matter. So you're going to have to start adding on to it. And then you start losing the whole point of the simple system. And that really adds up to a lot. Um, you can probably think of 50% tax as being a starting point. Uh, health could be, healthcare could be another 10 or 15%. So it's quite a bit. I won't dig into the numbers more than that because I don't really have the time and I don't want to bore you too much. Uh, so the problem is really that uh, if you have a basic income that's high enough to fulfill the hopes of the ideas promoters, it's going to be not affordable. Uh, and if you have it, or if you have it too low, it's not going to fulfill those hopes. If you have it too high, it's not really going to be affordable. It's not going to eliminate the bullshit jobs, as people say. So you're going to have to add these contingent elements, tailoring benefits to the individual or household circumstances, age, health, 
And what about people who live in New York City or London or Silicon Valley? Are they going to get the same UBI payment as someone living in uh, rural Texas where you know, housing is really cheap and living is cheap? That seems just kind of odd. It's not, it's not really treating people equally by giving them the same amount of money. So it's kind of misleading. Uh, without going to, to details of the economics, uh, I would argue that this program would slow economic growth and thereby in the long run impoverish everyone. Um, think, about, think about this. What if we'd imposed the system back in, say, the Industrial Revolution? What if we'd said, well, look, some people are making a lot of money with these machines. Let's tax the owners of the machines. Um, I think we would have slowed down progress, economic progress quite a lot, and then therefore kept people poorer. So we have to be a little bit careful about that. Of course, the argument is that AI-driven corporations will be so super wealthy that that won't be a problem. They can just skim some off the top and it'll be plentiful. Well, we'll see. That's certainly a big assumption. Uh, so yeah, we don't want to penalize the, the, the inventions that basically have made us free of poverty for the most part on subsistence farming. Uh, there's also, I think there will be an inflationary effect. And again, I can't get into the details of this, but both cost push from people who demand more wages for what remain of the lower end jobs and also monetary inflation, uh, which we're currently actually at considerable risk of if we continue spending all of this money uh, as if it can come from nowhere. Uh, I think one really problematic part of the idea is that it's sort of very much in the abstract, but if you think about real politics, what about the powerful groups that are going to dig in, entrepreneurs, big companies, rich people, unions, they're going to manipulate the system to their own ends. And you know, we have to really think about that because we can think, oh, we'll just replace it with this universal system, everything will be fine. But in the real world, that's not really how things work. You've got to really think about the details of implementation, who's going to resist that, and how they might try to uh, affect the payouts. Uh, some of those people are gonna lose power and influence by giving those direct payments, and they probably aren't gonna like that too much. Now, I want to stress here that I'm not making ethical objections to the UBI. I'm not taking some kind of hardcore libertarian stunt that it's, you know, any welfare is bad and therefore this is a bad idea. I'm not going to do that because that's not a very persuasive argument to those who don't share the political premises. Um, I'm not going to you know, talk about coercion or anything like that. I'm just discussing whether it's an effective and affordable system. So I personally think that the basic income idea is kind of a distraction for more, for more sensible, uh, feasible and necessary welfare reforms. So it's not, as one person discussing this said, it is simply not the case that there are simple solutions to apparently difficult issues which policymakers have hitherto been too stupid or corrupt to implement. Not that they're not stupid or corrupt because they are, but uh, I don't think that's sufficient to explain it. Now, just briefly, I want to touch on the idea of a negative income tax. This is one that uh, I'm not sure when it was first thought of. It's quite a while ago, but Milton Friedman is, is sort of known as the main champion of this. He was quite a free market guy, but he thought rather than having our current welfare system, a negative income tax is kind of like a UBI, except you don't pay everybody. What you do is, you, like with the UBI, you decide on what is the minimum income that people should have. And then if they're making more than that, they pay taxes. If they make less than that, they get basically a negative tax. So they get money back. Uh, so you know, if they earn zero and your, your basic income was 12,000, they will get 12,000 and so on. Uh, so that would be a bit less expensive because you're not paying to everybody, you're paying to people who are below that minimum. Uh, still, I think it has some real problems, big disincentive effects, especially around the, the point where you switch from uh, giving to receiving money. So I know because time is brief, I'm gonna very briefly sort of suggest some possible alternatives. <clears throat> uh, what, I'm, what I'm calling universal distributed capitalism, because I had to come up with a three letter acronym <laughs> to meet UBI, so we have UDC. Uh, basically, what this consists of is something that I think we can start doing now and should have been doing for a long time now. And it's been a failure of education that we haven't been doing this earlier on. And I've, I've taught uh, a lot of critical thinking classes, and I usually spend time on money management and investing in one of my classes. And my students say, well, this is great because nobody ever talked about this in school. And I had no clue how to do any of this stuff, which to me is insane. You know, managing your money effectively, especially with starting young, is really important. So the basic idea of universal distributed capitalism or universal distributed uh, wealth, if you prefer, is that it can take different forms. It can take more or less uh, compulsory forms. Uh, it basically encourages share ownership by a much larger, preferably everybody in society. Uh, currently, it's you know, only a fraction of the population really own many shares, and that's often through their 401k programs uh, or pension funds, and they haven't really chosen those themselves. Uh, if you start early with that, it makes a huge difference. I think everybody here understands exponential growth, compound interest is exponential growth. 
uh, if you start early, you can really actually have quite a bit of money by the time you're middle-aged and certainly before you're considered a senior by today's standards, which unfortunately I'm getting pretty close to myself. I don't feel that senior. Uh, so you know, giving dividends, which actually reduces a current income, rising share prices that you could sell off at various points could produce a decent income. So the first step to me is educate people about investing because they're not gonna do it or they're gonna do it really badly. Uh, they're gonna be paying people large amounts of money to manage the money when they should be using index funds. Um, they're gonna be taking too many risks. They're gonna be day trading, doing all kinds of things which I think are not, not sensible, at least not for the vast majority of people. Uh, so, you know, with compounding, you can start very small. Um, basically, if you, if you look at the numbers, someone who invests from the age of 18 until 35 could often just let that money sit there without adding any more money after 35, and it'll just keep compounding. And by the time they reach, say, say arbitrary age of 65, they may have more money than somebody who's been investing very hard from 45 to 65. That's because of all the compound interest they've been missing out on. So this comes in a whole range of different versions. Um, you could make it completely voluntary. Uh, that would be my preference, but you might say, well, look, that's not gonna work because people aren't gonna do that. Um, you could have various deg degrees of requirements. I think a good model here is the 501, uh, 401k. You could kind of expand this more broadly. The 401k basically, um, most I don't think it was always this way, but now basically it's kind of an opt out. So you have a 401k with certain companies, and money, you put some money in there, there's usually a default percentage, they will match it to a certain degree, and you do nothing and you get money, kind of like free money as well, it's pretty good. Uh, if we had something more universally like that throughout society, um, either, either by encouraging people to, to save and invest themselves, or by putting money in you know, through taxation or some other method, or, or donations from very rich people, whatever we want to do, uh, that could be a way of building up uh, wealth so that somebody eventually is essentially financially independent. They have a similar effect to the UBI, except they have more sense of ownership. They have a sense that they've earned that. Whereas one problem I think with the UBI is, it's basically as welfare. You're giving stuff to people and they're not earning it. And it's kind of like lottery winners who think they're gonna be really happy when they win the lottery. And they're actually a lot happier with the, the prospect of that. The reality is often not so good. Uh, and I think you know, that could be an issue here too. It's better if you feel like you've earned it and deserve it. So there's a whole wide range there from more or less compulsory. I would argue based on some economic research, that if you're gonna give people money as well, it's not a good idea to give them to them on a regular basis like monthly. Uh, that's gonna have worse disincentive to work. Uh, it's gonna have other bad incentives. It's actually better to give it to them one time. There's actually some research on this. Uh, one time payments, people will tend to uh, not put off things like repairing their car in order to get more, more payments. Uh, they will be more efficient. There's actually better effects on employment. So uh, if you're gonna do this, you could essentially give people an endowment. If we're gonna do it by taxes, give people an endowment at a certain age. I think 18 is probably too young. People are pretty irresponsible still at 18. Um, uh, but pick an age and give them money, maybe not let them touch it for a certain amount of time, let that build up. So there's a lot of different scenarios which I'm not gonna to detail too much here. Um, in fact, there was a British economist, I don't know, I think it's in the 50s, who uh, suggested something like that. that He said, quote, there should be a capital endowment, minimum inheritance, pay to all at adulthood. So that, that kind of idea. So the nice thing about this, is we can start implementing it now uh, to various degrees through education, through giving people shares, and it would fairly easily transform then into a future with AI-driven corporations. So, and further in the future, what I can imagine, because I tend to prefer non-coercive solutions, I'm hoping that one day we'll get into cyberspace, you know, much more fully than now, we'll get into actual space and we'll create whole new societies with different rules. And you'll be able to join a society and it will tell you, look, if you join the society, you're buying into a system in which we require that you put this amount of money into uh, something like a UBI or a single payment or to required share ownership. That's part of what it means to be part of this community. It's a little bit more difficult in real countries where you're kind of born into the system. So uh, I'm gonna stop, I think, around there to give people time for questions. And again, this is very much kind of a sketchy overview without too many numbers. Um, basic point is that I think people got a little overexcited with this idea. It seems very appealing, but we have to look at the details. We really want to help people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Max. <laughs> that was a brilliant talk, thank you. And I can tell you that it sparked a lot of debate in our, um, in our YouTube chat. So a lot of people were actually um, commenting and talking and also asking questions. And I'm gonna pass some of those questions for you. You have about 
nine minutes <laughs> to, to answer those questions. So I'm going to start with the first one that comes from Tim. Um, wouldn't UBI or similar schemes be counteracted by inflation? Uh, yes, for sure. I mean, obviously, you really have to index them for inflation. And again, this isn't something I've seen discussed very much. I think perhaps because we've had such low inflation in recent years, people aren't thinking about it too much. But yeah, you couldn't just say set it at 10,000 or 12,000 or whatever number. You'd have to index it for inflation. And um, that's going to be a consideration. Uh, there's also an issue I didn't kind of mention, uh, but it's relevant to this. Are we going to have um, a UBI based on your state, your province, your country, the world, the continent? Because different countries have different inflation rates. They have different levels of income. And it's not entirely obvious that it should be one for the entire US. I pointed out that some places are more expensive than others. Some places have higher in inflation than others. So again, that's an another complication we need to look at. Yes, thank you very much. Sorry, I'm juggling between uh, many different questions. So Mr. Stolyarov um, is asking, what about funding UBI via federal land dividend, leasing vast amounts of currently unused federal land to corporation in exchange for periodic payments that fund the UBI? That sounds a little bit like a Henry George scheme. I'm, I'm not quite sure. I haven't really looked at that possibility. Um, I don't know what the numbers would be. I don't think that would be anything like enough probably to, to fund something like a UBI, but uh, interesting idea. I'd have to look at the details. I don't have a, a great answer on, on the numbers for that one, but thank you. That's interesting. Yeah, this sounds a little bit like the land reform of the old days. So next question com comes from David. Um, what about the evidence that basic income schemes already in place in Alaska and elsewhere have had a strong bipartisan support? Uh, I think that they're primarily the support's been on the left, but there has been some on the right, it's true. Um, but having bipartisan support, well, it's unusual these days. <laughs> so that seems like a good idea, but maybe that's because it's such a, a simple idea that appeals very easily. Uh, maybe that explains it, that people are looking for an easy solution. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work. So we can't just say, well, it has support from both sides, so it's a good idea. Again, we've got to dig into the details of how exactly would we fund this? What's the level? How do we determine that? Uh, there's a lot of things we have to look at in detail, the boring details, unfortunately. It's a good start that it has, you know, maybe support on both sides, but uh, that's certainly not enough. Let's see, someone is asking a little bit of a tricky question. Let's see. Oh, good. <laughs> good um, how, how will providing a limited welfare to unlimited immigrants help the, the host countries and people? I'm not sure I got all that. Uh, how will, how will providing a limited welfare to unlimited immigrants help the host countries and their people? Well, yeah, I think I touched on that if I understand the question correctly. It's a, if you have unlimited immigration and you have a system like this in place, you're, and if nobody else does especially, or yours is a lot higher than other people's, it's, it's really a recipe for disaster. You're basically inviting people to come in and uh, get the guaranteed income, and that's gonna cause the, you know, the cost of the system to go up and up and up. So it's going to be you know, very quickly destructive. So that's one, that's actually one reason to have something like a, I think Robin Hansen called a world basic income, but that's also very difficult to do. How is someone in, you know, in a very poor African nation, or let's say the Sudan, or uh, compared to someone in London, how are you going to have a universal world income? I don't know. So that's a very tricky problem, you know, to settle on what, what is the right group of people, what the, what's the right geographic territory that we uh, base it on is tricky. And then, yeah, what do you do about immigrants? Uh, I would have no problem giving it to people who've gone through the process and become you know, residents, but giving it, if you're going to give it to anybody who's actually just living there, you're going to have a big problem, much more than we do now. Another interesting question. Could you see UBI as being a useful part of a wider system that also includes universal basic services, or are you totally opposed to it? Um, I'm not quite sure what that's asking, really. Is it asking not only do we give a certain amount of money to everybody, but we give a bunch of other services free. Uh, <clears throat> well, yeah. I, think, <clears throat> I think in some sense that's, that's going to happen naturally in that there are certain services that become quite cheap. Um, <clears throat> it used to be, you know, the, it's funny, we still have 800 numbers, right? Because it used to be that making a long distance call was expensive and people were, oh, don't talk to Aunt, Aunt Fanny too long because that's costing me a lot of money. Today, it's, it's just, you know, you just get the long distance call free, basically. So I think a number of those services, especially as AI comes along, the marginal cost will be so low uh, that it won't cost very much. I mean, this is kind of an interesting current example. 
Um, I'm not sure whether you say the company's name Gilead or Gilead because I've never heard it spoken, but uh, you know the one I'm talking about with the remdesivir drug. They are actually giving licenses to uh, poorer countries to produce generics of it or knockoffs of it, basically with their blessing uh, to price it at a much lower prices, so long as they don't sell to the rich countries. So long as they're making a profit margin from the wealthier countries, they can let people do that in poor countries. So just like we see people with uh, you know, very cheap mobile phone plans, who it would be unimaginable in the past that people would have these supercomputers in their pockets if they were poor. I think we will see that quite naturally as part of the system. If you're talking about it being run by government, I think that's not not a great idea. Government is not very good on the production end of things. It's really there to perform certain functions and producing stuff is not really one of those unless they're public goods that you know the market has a hard time handling. Let's see, do I have time? I think, um, yeah, we do have time for one more question. Let me see what can I pick from, from the community. Um, UBI is an interesting idea, but money has some relation to Bourdieu's, I hope I pronounce it correctly, Bourdieu's notion, notion of social capital. It has a symbolic dimension. People might not be willing to lose power. How do you see it? Well, yeah, I did touch upon that point. I think uh, you're going to disintermediate a lot of people, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, there's a huge welfare bureaucracy, which generally I think is pretty bad as it is. It could be very demeaning. Um, you know, there's, there's a real point to having things like means testing, because you don't want to be giving money to people who really don't need it when there are other people who need help. But at the same time, it can be pretty unpleasant that you've got to prove that you're poor <laughs> and in need, and that could be <clears throat> quite embarrassing. So that's one of the appealing things about UBI is you just do away with that, right? But the downside is it's, it makes it a lot more expensive. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it, money is not just money. It really, how you get that money uh, and how you deal with it really has a big effect. And I kind of touched on that with lottery winners. People assume if you win the lottery, yay, things are fantastic. Well, no, a lot of them get very depressed. A lot of them they go bankrupt because they don't know how to manage their money. You know, we've seen uh, music stars who have you know millions or even billions of dollars uh, going bankrupt uh, because they don't, can't manage the money. That's why I think we should really be starting with financial education, which we're doing a terrible job of right now uh, for any of these kind of systems to work. Um, even people who would have very low incomes, if they start saving even a small amount early on, that really grows a lot over time, but people don't really have that concept. And by the way, I would suggest that if we do have a system where either voluntary or some kind of requirement for putting money aside, uh, I think that should be bankruptcy proof, just as certain retirement plans sometimes are in some states or houses sometimes are, that should be proof against bankruptcy because otherwise you kind of lose the point of it. Yep. Matt is asking, your earlier point seems to imply that a problem with UBI is that it's wasteful. What what would you say to people who argue that one of the main benefits is that it saves by removing means test testing? It saves clear? by removing means testing? <clears throat> well, it does save some. It's going to save some of the uh, cost of the bureaucracy. That's true. Um, but I don't think that is enough. It's not going to make up for all those people, you know, hundreds of millions of people in the States who will be getting money they really don't need, people in households who don't need it. Um, even just putting on a household basis, I think would really help. And that wouldn't be so invasive to test individual incomes. Uh, but yeah, if you don't do that, or you don't adjust it for age or for health, then you're really going to be throwing money at people who say, oh, thanks very much. I didn't really need that, but that's nice. <laughs> and then other people who are saying, what about me? I'm, I'm poor and sick and old, and I can't possibly survive on this amount. So I think we have to have some kind of means testing. Um, so that's the problem with doing away with that kind of bureaucracy. Hopefully it could be reformed in some way that would make it uh, less invasive. 